Good morning, LFC. Oh, lovely. Love it when you get a response. Whew. Yes, we're up here and we're here together. And good morning to all those that are online, live. It's all very funky, isn't it, being live? You can sit home and sip your coffee and participate at the distance. But hopefully you'll sense the atmosphere here. And it's done a great job to kick us off. And I really like that prayer. That is a good prayer. And reflect on that. We might get a copy of that one. I want to share a little experience last night. It was pretty funny, actually. Um, we got, Karen and I got this late call, sort of, you know, Dad and Mum, can you come up and babysit? We need some space. So we go up to Tacoma and the boys are asleep. Now, they're three and one. So, you know, there's a lot going on at three and one, isn't there? Everyone's nodding their heads. I know the gig. And for all those that have been grandparents, you know, we got it down on fine art, haven't we? Not. <laughs> so we get up there and they can sneak out. They're only going local. They said, just ring us if you need us. You know, oh, we'll be fine. We won't need you. I think we got seven and a half minutes in before Eli, the youngest one, woke up. So you do all the typical things you do, you know. You try and pacify, wrap them up tight, walk them around. Settles a bit, doesn't settle, and then it gets louder, louder. Right, okay, plan B. All right, so we get the new fangdangle. What do you, I don't even know what you call it. The carrier thing, strap him on. I go out in the backyard, and he's just getting louder and louder. So I'm bouncing him, I'm singing, which is a really bad move. You don't want to hear me sing. Well, attempt to anyway, to pacify little Eli. And he seemed to settle, and then he gets louder again. And he seemed to settle. Uh, this is not working out. I'm working up into a bit of a sweat here. And then the neighbours over the fence that have got their own social thing going on, they can see over, and of course all the women are looking at you like, you're not doing it right. <laughs> you can see the list, you know, if you checked his nappy, give him a bottle, that's not how you rock him. Your voice is terrible, whatever it is, you know, all the judgments happening, I'm starting to feel really insecure now. So we try a bit longer because we don't want to wave the white flag, but, but after about 50 minutes, we waved the white flag. There was no option. So Jake and Sarah come home, and it's really fascinating to watch, isn't it? As soon as Eli sees mum, everything starts to change. All the women, are, they know this experience. And it's fascinating, isn't it? You can be granny, you can be old. I'm not called grandpa or pop, I'm old mate. Uh, which my sons got together and came and told me to be old mate. And I said, oh, we'll see what the little guys do. Well, of course, I get old mate. It doesn't matter what I do. It doesn't matter what granny does, as wonderful as they might be. And, it doesn't, and even dad, who's really, really good, there's something about that connection with mum, isn't there? particularly when they're that fragile age. It's very, very special to watch. And lo and behold, two minutes later, what's he doing? Playing with old mate and giggling. Because his world is secure with the presence of mum. Beautiful, isn't it? It's a beautiful image. So as we come to communion today, I just found myself driving here this morning thinking about that experience last night and waving the white flag, you know, even though granny and old mate do it pretty well, what we'd like to think we do. There's something unique about that relationship. So as we come to communion and those experiences of those moments in life when things don't quite add up, I don't know what your week's been like, maybe you've had a fantastic week, maybe it's been a celebratory week. For others, Maybe it's just breathing deeply, back to school, trying to find your rhythm again, get in the workplace. Maybe there's some extended family stuff going on that doesn't add up. There's just moments when we need God. We just, we just have those mum moments where in the frustration or the confusion or the uncertainty or the anxiety or the insecurity. When we, when we get that sense of connection once again, 
then all the troubles and the hassles or the messiness or the tension, can, you can start to breathe and find energy to be in that space, live with dignity and be able to respond rather than react. There's something powerful about that. And I think communion provides that sacred space to move into that sense of connection. Just being in, having God's presence just makes all the difference that I can laugh again, makes all the difference that I can engage again effectively, just like for the Lulai with his mum. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, how the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed, he took a piece of bread, he gave thanks and he broke it. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So if you've got your little canisters there, for those at home that you're ready. And it seems in the imagery of this, sometime later, he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. So as often as you drink, keep doing so in memory of me. And then that last statement, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, we, you, us, we proclaim his death until he comes. This is the body of Christ broken for you. Take and eat. And of course, this is Christ's blood shed for you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this simple meal. We thank you, Lord, that we can come to you and week by week, whatever is happening for us, whether we're in a good place or not such a good place, whether we're celebrating or whether we're grieving, whether we're hurting or whether we're feeling empowered. We thank you, Lord, that at any time, at any stage, we can know your presence and things are righted. We sense your peace. We can breathe deeply. And we can continue to honour you and honour each other and honour ourselves. We thank you for these powerful symbols. And we ask, Lord, that your spirit would just move afresh amongst us, in us, Individually and collectively. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Okay, I wonder if they, um, if we've got some kids, whether they'd like to come down on the front step here. I shall remain one and a half metres away from you. (laughs) And we're going to do something interesting today. So feel free to come down. And perfect, perfect. Okay, so Pond officially starts today. And... uh, Pond is all about one thing, really. There's a promise that Jesus made to all of us here just after he was risen from the dead. And he made that promise to you as well. He said, I will be with you always. I'll be with you always. And in Pond, you're going to find out what that means. Now, there's something else which is with me always, and that's this little thing. <laughs> And uh, when I got one of these, I thought it was, it was amazing. I didn't know what it could do. It 
could do all sorts of things. It's got within it the ability to take photos. Look, here's a photo of myself, <laughs> which I took from another screen, a screen of a screen. It can take photos, it can take movies, and during the shutdown, I took movies of myself using this thing. Amazing. And it can even have phone calls, although uh, apparently people under 25 don't use these for phone calls anymore. It's a uh, mind boggles. But um, you can look on the internet, you can get emails, you can do chats with your friends, there's Facebook, there's games. I can talk to my grandkids in America um, face to face through this. It's just amazing what it can do. And it's also got a, a little um, uh, artificial intelligence in it, um, which listens to you and misunderstands everything you say. <laughs> it's called Siri. It's very ingenious. However, this goes with me always. It can also measure how many steps I take in a day. Doesn't that clever? It does so many really good things, but I know that in 10 years' time, this is going to be in a tip. It will. There will be something better that will come along. And even though I think this is fantastic, there's going to be something better. But I want you to know that Jesus with me is a thousand times better than this. Amazing though this is, in 10 years' time, Jesus will be with me and this won't. Every day, Jesus does amazing things. And the thing about Jesus' promise to be with you is that, like this has all sorts of things you learn about what it means for it to be with you, so too, in Pond, you're going to learn about what it means for Jesus to be with you and all the interesting things that Jesus can do in your life. Important things, really important things. So we're going to commission our Pond leaders and helpers today. So uh, you guys stay on the, the steps there, but you're going to help with a prayer. And I'm going to get the Pond leaders and uh, helpers uh, wearing masks to come up here and socially distance themselves around the front and one and a half metres, and a sure test for an adult of one and a half metres is, if you can touch the other person, you're too close. That's the test. <laughs> so, yes, mill around. You don't have to be in a circle especially. So, kids, um, could you stand up and look towards these leaders? And with me, um, and with the other people here, just hold out your hand like this. It's, it's a symbol that we're praying to God uh, for them. All right, so let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for these special people. In their lives, they've heard you, they've loved you, and they've been loved by you. And they're willing to share this with the young people in our church. Lord, bless them, we pray. Bless them with a good heart, deep love, with wisdom at the right time, and may your spirit move in everything that happens in the pond this year. May you create an atmosphere of love, and may you bind us all together in a community made up of different ages. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. And now it is time for pond. So uh, who's leading the way to pond? Alistair and Teresa today. Okay, follow those people. So just while I'm up here, uh, and we're, whilst we're having a casual conversation, um, there's two things I want to say. Uh, the first is, uh, today is Catherine and Manola's final day with us here, so it's uh, yes, oh, thank you, thank you, that is the correct response. Uh, we will miss you, and we know that you go on to uh, Lee and Gaffer. Um, I love Gippsland, so I'm sure you're going to enjoy it there. Um, and uh, we just want to quickly pray God's blessing on your way, if we can. So. Dear God, we thank you that you know, bring into the church family people who enrich us uh, with their faith, and enthusiasm and love. So we just thank you for Catherine and Manola, and we pray your blessing on their new phase in life, um, and we just pray that there they may find also a, a church family that will nurture them and love them, and they can, can take their place there. 
Be with him, we pray, as you promised at Easter time. Amen. Secondly, on a, uh, another serious note, is about our social distancing um, in, in the life of the church. Uh, we, we got a bit over full last week and we got stuck in the foyer and we began to talk to each other and we forgot our social distancing. I'll remind you to take it very seriously. There is one thing in common with most people who get COVID uh, and that is they didn't know where they got it from. It is a surprise to them. They are surprised. I didn't know someone in the Bunnings had COVID. Uh, otherwise, I would have been more careful. Uh, I didn't know somebody in Safeways had COVID. Otherwise, I would have been more careful. Everybody is surprised when they get it because the people look all healthy and okay around them. My prayer is that if anyone got COVID, walked into this church and at the end of the service walked out, that nobody else would get it because we followed social distancing, kept our hands clean, kept the masks on, did the whole bit. Um, so keep each other safe. When we come to church, we make a commitment to each other, and that commitment's to each other, to uh, abide by that mask wearing and the social distancing and keeping our hands clean. And uh, so I encourage you strongly, take it seriously, and then worship will just be about worship. Our conversations will just be sharing with one another. If you are like me and you really find it hard to talk with a mask on, uh, at the end of the service, don't stay in the foyer, go outside, social distance, feel free to take your mask off. You can do that and talk to people outside. So, um, and that's probably what I'll be doing at the end of the service. So. But still social distance. Okay, Bruce, hand it over to you. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Living Faith Church. Welcome also to those who are worshipping at home. It's good to have you with us as well. Over the last eight days, there have been a number of things that have been happening. We had a barbecue on the Saturday, not yesterday, but the previous Saturday, at Bunnings, and we were all social distancing there at the barbecue. And we raised $837, and, uh, but there is still $25 worth of uh, drinks that Bill might uh, sell off at a later stage. You may even get them at a discount. But Bill would also like to thank everybody who helped, because uh, without helpers, we would, wouldn't have been able to make that barbecue such a success. So thank you to all those who helped at the barbecue. On Wednesday was the funeral of Frank Critchley, who uh, for a number of years regularly attended our Friendship Centre here at Living Faith Church. And uh, our thoughts and prayers are with Christine and uh, her family at this time. And of course yesterday was the marriage of Elise and Cam, and, which was attended by, in person by many from this congregation, but others were able to watch online, and that was fantastic. It was really great to see the wedding and uh, we wish our blessings and offer our congratulations to Elise and Cam on their marriage. We'll now move to the slides which we've got here. And the first one is backs for packs. Now, Jan is here today and there are some backpacks already arriving. So backpacks and stationery can be left in the foyer and will be collected in February. It is February, so please get those backpacks ready and bring them along to church so that they can be collected by Jan. The next item. Lenten studies are about to begin and the theme of our Lenten studies is rediscovering values. So you can join one of the existing life groups over Lent on Monday nights on Zoom Wednesday, night, Wednesday nights on Zoom or face-to-face, -face, or a Lenten study group, Wednesdays at 10am in the fellowship room. And these will be beginning in the week commencing 14th of February, although two groups, the Wednesday groups, are starting on the 10th of February. You can see more details in Getting Connected or talk to Vic or phone Vic. Next one, thank you. 
ladies' night out. It's time for our ladies of the church to gather for dinner. And so if you're interested in that, if you could contact uh, Leanne to let her know if you're able to go, that's going to be at the Montmorency RSL in Mountain View Road, Montmorency, on Tuesday the 16th of February at 6.30pm. The annual general meeting of the Greensboro Church of Christ annual general meeting is going to be on Sunday the 14th of February at 11.30am after worship here in the chapel. So if you're a member of the Church of Christ or if you're interested in coming to that meeting, uh, you are welcome to come to that. And if you would like to connect with us at Living Faith Church, for those who are worshipping online that uh, may not uh, be in touch with us, we'd love to receive your email at welcome at livingfaithchurch.org.au. That concludes our notices, and we're now going to move to our prayers for God's mission. Your responses to the words, God of grace, is hear our prayer. Let us pray. Praise to you, faithful God, for you set the stars in the heavens and all of the world was shaped by your hands. We pray for your creation, for a sense of wonder and delight at its beauty, for wisdom and justice in the use of this bounty. God of grace, hear our prayer. Praise to you, faithful God, for you feed the hungry, lift up the downtrodden and set the captive free. We pray for all peoples, for an end to violence, exploitation and oppression, for peace and harmony among nations. God of grace, hear our prayer. Praise to you, faithful God, for you have called us by our name and brought us into the company of all believers. We pray for your church, for a community open to the movement of your spirit, for a passion to proclaim your gospel in the world. God of grace, hear our prayer. Praise to you, faithful God, for you welcome the outcast, bring strength to the weary. Your love for your people is steadfast and sure. We pray for all who live or work in our region, for the building up of community, for the sharing of resources and care of those in need. God of grace, hear our prayer. Praise to you, Father God, for you heal the sick, bind up the brokenhearted and bring life and wholeness to your people. In this moment of silence, we pray for those people and situations that are on our hearts and minds at this time. We pray for all in anxiety, pain or grief, for comfort for the sorrowing, relief for the suffering and peace for the dying. God of grace, hear our prayer. Praise to you, faithful God, for you have broken the bonds of death and promised to your people the joys of everlasting life. God of grace, hear our prayer. We ask these things in the name of Jesus, and together we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen.
Today's reading is from Mark 1, verses 29 to 39. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. That evening, after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he travelled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Well, what a story. It was just a 24 hours of Jesus' life was in last week's reading and this week's reading. Now, often in, these, in the gospel stories, you have general statements like uh, Jesus went around preaching in their synagogues, uh, driving out demons. So that's a general sort of thing. Obviously, he's on the road, don't know how many weeks or whatever. It's, but this particular story is part of a 24-hour episode. And you've got to ask, Mark's focused on this for a reason. Why is he doing that? So let's, t- let's follow Jesus in that story. So the day begins well in last week's reading. Uh, he goes to the synagogue and he teaches there and people are amazed at his authority because the way rabbis normally talk is the way um, uh, perhaps um, theologians might talk. They'll say, well, this theologian says this and this theologian says that. Uh, there's a range of views, and on the whole, you know, I tend to prefer this one. So, in other words, you're basing your ideas upon other experts who are thinking about stuff, and this is the one you prefer. But Jesus just came in and said, uh, this is what the passage means, da 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 So he had authority in himself, and he had a new perspective, a different perspective, and the people were amazed because he didn't do all the referencing stuff that rabbis normally do. So the morning starts out really well. Jesus has come to teach about the kingdom of God. Uh, they hear him preaching about the kingdom of God. They're amazed that he's, he's teaching. Uh, and so they're seeing him as a teacher. Suddenly in the service, uh, there is a man who has a demon. And uh, so, you know, leaps up and says, what have you got to do with us, Jesus? And Jesus ca- silences the demon, casts him out. So... Uh, so things have taken a different turn. Later in the day, he he's, feels as though he's had a successful ministry that morning. Uh, he goes to the mother-in-law of uh, Simon Peter, and um, she's got a fever. He heals her, and she uh, serves him. But meanwhile, um, whilst the dinner is being pref- um, given, great hospitality, which is a great Middle East tradition, um, Along comes just about everyone in the district, where they're sick and where they're demon possessed, etc. So, and Jesus heals them all. He heals all those who are sick. He silences all the demons and casts them all out. And um, there is so many people. They're just massed at the door of the house. I don't know if he just sat down on a seat beside the front door or what. Um, but I don't know if they're in an orderly queue, one and a half metres apart, or whether they whether they were just keen to get there and it was a shambles sort of thing. I'm, I suspect it was more the latter, to be honest, because um, when there's some slim hope that your loved one who is so sick can be healed, uh, emotions tend to ride high. 
So I imagine it was a very emotional sort of gathering of people who came to that house outside that door. And emotional with anticipation, anxiety, uh, elbows and irritation, and also emotional with uh, joy at healing and uh, their loved one being released from the demonic. So highly emotional stuff taking place. And I don't know if you remember what it's like to be in highly emotional situations, but it's wearing. It really is wearing. And so that's what Jesus faced. So he's come to the end of the day, and he's suddenly thinking, you know, at the start of the day, I was a preacher and a teacher, and people loved my teaching. At the end of the day, no one remembers what I said. No one can remember a single thing I taught. All they can remember is that Auntie Joan, who is ill, is now well. All they can remember is their grandchild, who is, who is possessed, is now free. That's, so what is my role? Who am I? Jesus is saying. Now, it doesn't say that in the text, but you understand that by that, that's what's happening the next day. Because he gets up very early in the morning before everyone else, and he goes out to a place on his own. Now, that is, that's rather hard in a, um, uh, a rural-type society where fishermen are up at dawn. So uh, he had to go to find a place where nobody else was. And he prayed. And you've got to say, why did he do that? Wasn't he absolutely exhausted by that previous day? Wasn't that enough for him? But the urgency of that prayer was such that he was willing to go out, sacrifice his sleep, I mean, who likes to get up at 5 a.m. in the morning, which is probably when he got up, or 4.30 a.m.? He sacrificed all of that in order to figure out something with God. What was so important that he had to go and figure out something with God? And it was simply this. He was trying to figure out what, the, what his ministry was going to be. In the morning, he was a teacher. But by the evening, he was a healer. What was he going to be? What was the balance going to be? And so he brought himself before God and said, help me focus. What is the most important thing? Dear God, help me. So it doesn't say that was his prayer there. So where am I getting this insight from, this sudden insight that that's what he prayed about? It's because when they finally found him uh, and uh, said to him, everyone's looking for you, he replied, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. So I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So obviously the question of why have I come? Why am I here? What is my ministry? That was the question that was uppermost in his mind that he took to prayer. And in the confusion of the evening before with so many emotions and so many people cramming forward with our hopes and dreams all riding upon Jesus, that would have been so hard for Jesus to be able to turn away even a single person. It would be so hard to think clearly in that moment about what shall I do. So he effectively short-circuited the same thing happening the next day by heading off to the next village. He didn't wait for another crowd to form outside Peter's mother-in-law's house. He could have, if he decided to, to spend some more time there, there would have been a whole lot more people as the word got out. But Jesus prayed and asked God what his focus should be in life. And that's the lesson we need to take away from this passage. Because that's you and I, isn't it? The tyranny of the urgent, the stuff that piles in upon you and you forget who you are and what's the most important thing that you do with your life. And we end up just doing stuff. We fill in the hours. We live the same 24 hours as everybody else. But is it what you're meant to be doing with your life? Is it the thing that brings greatest satisfaction? And so often I can say in my life, as a Christian and as a minister, no is the answer. The tyranny of the urgent has got the better of me 
and I've lost my focus, lost my attention, and lost what is most important for me to be doing in my life. And Vic is nodding away, I understand. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just the nature of life. And this happens for a number of reasons. For Jesus, he had a, a pile of people at, his, his, uh, at the front door. And so uh, they are in his face. What is it for you and I? We don't have a pile of people queued at our door looking for healing. But what is it that throws us off? What is the equivalent in our life? Sometimes it's um, other people's demands on your life. You are a yes person. And if other people say, do this and do that, you say yes. <laughs> and before long, uh, you've got 26 hours of things to do in 24 hours. And that in itself is a problem. What you need if you're a yes person is what Jesus did. You need the time of prayer alone with Jesus. And he spent it alone because he didn't need any more voices talking to him. He was already having enough trouble saying yes to people. Prayer, it's a beautiful, beautiful gift. I don't know how you feel when I say the word prayer, whether your heart leaps and say, I love prayer, or whether your shoulders sag and say, oh, yeah, we have to do prayer. It's a Christian's duty to do prayer. Um, I've got to pray for so-and-so and so-and-so. And, so and, so. and uh, But it's not a joyful activity. It's a joyless activity. Because it's all about what's wrong with the world, and there's always more that's wrong with the world. There's always more problems. You never seem to get to the bottom of the list. So the question is, what is your prayer like? What is your prayer life like? And sometimes prayer is part of the problem, the way you're praying. For Jesus, his time of silence with God was engaging with God about the key questions in his life. He had to ask God some key questions. And the Spirit stirred so that he understood where God's will was in the midst of that. Augustine used to talk about uh, meeting God in the garden and having a conversation with God. And um, so uh, even if he wasn't in the garden, for him that was his, his special space. So even if he was in a room on his own, etc., he imagined himself and God having a conversation in the garden about the key issues like this and how we would do that. That may be an exercise that, that you could do, even in your own life, imagining sitting with Christ in a, a secluded garden, a secret garden, if you will, having conversations together. This sort of prayer brings life. This sort of prayer brings life. And it brings joy, and it brings you back into balance again. And don't we need our balance to be thrown off balance is a very unpleasant experience. There's um, what other things are like the masses of people at the door that threw Jesus off? Well, there's the incessant voices that we listen to. And sometimes there are so many people uh, we listen to who are telling us different things that you know, our life just becomes confusing. But sometimes the incessant voices are because we're actually listening to the wrong things. We're filling our head with the wrong things. You know, uh, one thing that um, the COVID brought out was uh, binge watching. And, um, you know, you can raise your hand if you've ever binge watched anything. You just, yeah, yeah, there's a few people who have binge watched. See, the thing about binge watching is, is that you find something really good and you say, I can't wait to see what happens next. You know, I have to watch the next episode. And uh, they have this delightful thing that allows you to skip the introduction and, and skip the rehash and so on. You can go straight to the next thing. And it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing when it's a great story and it enriches you. Well, that, that one finishes. And then you go to Netflix and you look, oh, what else can I watch? <laughs> And you have a look down the list and say, oh, maybe that. Well, you know, it turns out that it's a bit second rate, actually. But, you know, maybe the next episode is going to be good. Maybe the next episode. And then, you know, you've binge watched that. And then there's something else that you watch. I've discovered that there are thousands of things on Netflix I don't want to ever watch. 
in my entire life. <laughs> it's just extraordinary. And what's more, um, Stan has a totally different selection, and most of them I don't want to ever watch either. And now there's a new one out called Binge, appropriately, and even more that I don't ever want to watch. But the trouble is, we often do watch lots of stuff that's not good for us. We, uh, we sampled something on Binge uh, called Perry Mason, and I enjoyed Perry Mason in the 60s or 70s, Raymond Burr and so on, and the very distinctive music uh, at the start. Yeah, some people know what I'm talking about. Um, anyway, so I thought, great, I'd love something wholesome when I watch Perry Mason. Well, yeah, several bottles of sauce later, um, and I use the term liberally, um, you know, there was violence, there was sex, there was, you know, horrific elements in it. Now I'm thinking, this is not the Perry Mason I knew. And so that was that for Perry Mason. And then, um, you know, had a look at something else. I love sci-fi. Why does sci-fi have to be associated with horror? I don't know why. Anyway, so that also lasted one episode. Um, and so on with, with many shows. But I'm, what I'm getting at is that when you fill your mind with violence and with sex and with stories of revenge and stories of worldliness and backstabbing and gossip and hurt and pain and jealousy and broken relationships, what do you think is going to happen? It, it sinks in. It becomes the air you breathe. There's too much of it. And the word of God and the peace of God finds it hard to get a word in edgeways into all that darkness. Because in the worlds that these Hollywood producers create, there's no room for God. There's no room for healing. There's no room for people you know, who are going the extra mile for the other person. So what do you fill your mind with? And that is something that can throw you off. If your mind is filled with this stuff, then it's hard to focus on what really matters and what's really important in life. And when it comes to the crunch, when it comes to issues in life like romance, where do you get your ideas from? When it comes to the crunch, when it comes to uh, issues of revenge or reconciliation, where do you get your ideas from? What are you filling your head with? And so we come back to the whole thing of the time with God to get it sorted, to figure yourself out. So, so precious. And finally, I want to say this doesn't just apply to individuals, you know, like any of us here or at home. This actually applies to communities. Communities as a whole can drift. And the church has been as much in trouble with this as any other community or group of people. It's called mission drift. That's the phrase that they use. When you actually start and your purpose is very clear, your purpose is to follow Jesus Christ and do the things of Jesus in the world, and then gradually over time, for whatever reason, you end up as a community that's all about something quite different. So it may be about uh, just keeping the building going or paying the minister or fundraising or something like that. And suddenly you wake up and you say, how did we get from, from there to here? Where, where did it go amiss? When did that happen? And the only way to really figure out as a community how to get it right is this, this working with God on what is most important and being able to set aside those things that perhaps you've even loved but are not the most important. To always ask and pray, what is the most important thing? And you know, your church council has been doing that over the last couple of years, asking again and again and again, what is the most important for a church community to be about? And I hope and pray that each of you is praying that as well for your uh, beloved community of Living Faith Church. Who are we called to be? Who are we meant to be? What is our role in this community? Our role is to follow Jesus and make a difference, to bring everyone closer to God. It's about transformed lives. It's about serving others. 
It's about acceptance and forming a community of love. It's about growth and continuing to grow in ourselves and our relationship with God. That's what it is to be living faith church following Jesus. But we get thrown off our game again and again and again. And uh, at, at church council we've had some great intentions and, and then we've gone back to doing things the old way and then we suddenly wake up and we say, oh, no, we're supposed to be doing this. And your best intentions take you so far. The discipline of coming back in prayer, that's what keeps us on track. So I commend to you prayer, this sort of prayer, not the, the prayer that weighs you down as a, as a burden, um, not the prayer that is faithless, I don't expect anything to come from this, but the prayer that is about conversation with God, in which you lean into God and listen. For God has something to say. I commend this prayer to you. I'm going to give you just a little bit of a moment now and just to think in yourself, when I go to prayer next, what is it that I need to attend to with God? What is it that I need to attend to? So don't attend to it here. Just find out what that question is that you're going to attend to with God. So let's have a bit of silence and you're at home as well. A bit of silence to attend to that moment with God. Our God, I confess to you now that there are times when I have been thrown off my game. There are times when I've been unbalanced in my life, in priorities, in my relationship with you. Lord, if that is, if that is us now, then we pray that our next prayer time will be amazing. Help us to get us back on walking the path with Jesus. We pray your blessing on that next prayer time. And Lord, if our time is right with you now, then we give to you our next prayer time praying for Living Faith Church. There's a community we may not be thrown off our game, but we may be true to the way of Christ. Oh Lord, we give to you our prayer. Please take it and do something wonderful with it. And the insights we gain, help us, our God, to share them where it's appropriate to share them. We pray all of this in Jesus, who walks with us always. Amen.